The Battle of Caporetto, also known as the Twelfth Battle of the Isonzo, the Battle of Cobrid or the Battle of Carfrate, was a battle on the Italian front of World War I. The battle was fought between the Kingdom of Italy and the Central Powers and took place from the 24th of October to the 19th of November 1917 near the town of Cobrid, now in northwestern Slovenia, then part of the Austrian littoral. The battle was named after the Italian name of the town, also known as Carfrate in German. Austro-Hungarian forces, reinforced by German units, were able to break into the Italian front line and rout the Italian forces opposing them. The battle was a demonstration of the effectiveness of the use of stormtroopers and the infiltration tactics developed in part by Oskar von Huttier. The use of poison gas by the Germans also played a key role in the collapse of the Italian Second Army. Prelude. Throughout the spring and summer of 1917, the Italians had launched numerous offensives on the Austro-Hungarian lines in the Isonzo sector, with the 11th Battle of the Isonzo being the most successful in pushing back the Austro-Hungarians. After the Italian success in the 11th Battle of the Isonzo, Emperor Karl knew a breakthrough was going to happen at any moment, as both the Austro-Hungarians and Italians were exhausted, and running out of men to sustain the war. So, he wrote to the Kaiser and requested German forces be deployed to Italy. In August 1917 Paul von Hindenburg decided to send troops from the Eastern Front to the Isenzo sector. Erich Ludendorff was opposed to this but was overruled. Later, in September three experts from the Imperial General Staff, led by the chemist Otto Hahn, went to the Isenzo Front to find a site suitable for a gas attack. They proposed attacking the quiet Caporetto sector, where a good road ran west through a mountain valley to the Venetian plain. The Austro-Hungarian army group Borovic, commanded by Svetozar Borovic, was prepared for the offensive. In addition, a new 14th Army was formed with nine Austrian and six German divisions, commanded by the German Otto von Below. The Italians inadvertently helped by providing weather information over their radio. Battle Foul weather delayed the attack for two days but on 24 October there was no wind and the front was misted over. At 2 o'clock, 894 metal tubes similar to Leuven's projectors Gaswerfminen, dug into a reverse slope, were triggered electrically to simultaneously fire canisters containing 600 milliliters 21 imp Florida Oz, 20 U.S. fluid ounces of chlorine arsenic agent and diphosgene, smothering the Italian trenches in the valley in a dense cloud of poison gas. Knowing that their gas masks could protect them only for two hours or less, the defenders fled, though 500 to 600 were still killed. Then the front was quiet until 6 o'clock, when all the Italian wire and trenches to be attacked were bombarded by mortars. At 6.41, 2,200 guns opened fire, many targeting the valley road along which reserves were advancing to plug the gap. At 8 o'clock two large mines were detonated under strong points on the heights bordering the valley and the infantry attacked. Soon they penetrated the almost undefended Italian fortifications in the valley, breaching the defensive line of the Italian 2nd Army between the 4th and 27th Corps. To protect the attackers' flanks, Alpine troops infiltrated the strong points and batteries along the crests of the adjoining ridges, Matajur and Kolovrat, laying out their telephone lines as they advanced to maintain contact with their artillery. Specially trained and equipped stormtrooper units led attacks, making good use of the new German Model 08, 15 Maxim light machine gun, light trench mortars, mountain guns, flamethrowers, and hand grenades. The attackers in the valley marched almost unopposed along the excellent road toward Italy, some advanced 25 kilometers 16 miles on the first day. The Italian army beat back the attackers on either side of the sector where the central column attacked, but below successful central penetration threw the entire Italian army into disarray. Forces had to be moved along the Italian front in an attempt to stem von Below's breakout, but this only weakened other points along the line and invited further attacks. At this point, the entire Italian position was threatened. The Italian Second Army commander Luigi Capello was bedridden with fever. Recognizing that his forces were ill-prepared for this attack and were being routed, Capello requested permission to withdraw to the Taglamento. Cadorna, who believed the Italian force could regroup and hold out, denied the request. 
Finally, on 30 October 1917, Cadorna ordered the majority of the Italian force to retreat to the other side of the Taglamento. It took the Italians four full days to cross the river, and by this time the German and Austro-Hungarian armies were on their heels, ambushing the defenders whenever they could. These ambushes would become known as the Battle of Pozzuolo. Eventually, the retreating Italian soldiers were able to break through the Austro-German encirclement and retreat to the Taglamento River. Then, on 2 November, a German division had established a bridgehead on the Taglamento River. About this time, however, the rapid success of the attack caught up with them. The German and Austro-Hungarian supply lines were stretched to the breaking point and unable to launch another attack to isolate a part of the Italian army against the Adriatic. Cadorna was able to retreat further and by 10 November had established a position on the Piave River and Monte Grappa, where the last push of the German and Austro-Hungarian forces was met and defeated by Italian forces at the First Battle of Monte Grappa. Even before the battle, Germany was struggling to feed and supply its armies in the field. Erwin Rommel, who as a junior officer won the Paul Le Marite for his exploits in the battle, often bemoaned the demands placed upon his poorly fed troops. The Allied blockade of the German Empire, which the Kaiserliche Marine had been unable to break, had led to food shortages and widespread malnutrition in Germany and the Central Powers in general. The inadequate provisioning, as well as the grueling night marches preliminary to the Battle of Caporetto, took a toll on the German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Despite these logistical problems, the initial assault was extremely successful. However, as the area controlled by the combined Central Powers forces expanded, an already limited logistical capacity was overstrained. By the time the attack reached the Piave, the soldiers of the Central Powers were running low on supplies and were feeling the effects of exhaustion. As the Italians began to counter the pressure put on them, the German forces lost momentum and were once again caught up in another round of attrition warfare. Aftermath Analysis Brian R. Sullivan called Caporetto the greatest defeat in Italian military history, John R. Schindler wrote. By any standard, 12th Isenzo and its aftermath represented an unprecedented catastrophe for Italian arms. The disaster came as a shock and triggered a search for scapegoats, culminating in a 1919 Italian military commission that investigated the causes of the debacle. At Rapallo, a Supreme War Council was created to improve Allied military cooperation and develop a common strategy. Luigi Cadorna was forced to resign after the defeat, a final straw according to the Prime Minister, Vittorio Emmanuel Orlando. Cadorna was known to have maintained poor relations with the other generals on his staff and by the start of the battle, had sacked 217 generals, 255 colonels and 355 battalion commanders. In addition, he was detested by his troops as being too harsh. Cadorna had been directing the battle 20 miles 32 km behind the front and retreated another 100 miles 160 km to Padua when replaced by Armando Diaz and Pietro Badoglio. Italian propaganda officers were established, promising land and social justice to soldiers. Italy also accepted a more cautious military strategy from this point on. Diaz concentrated his efforts on rebuilding his shattered forces while taking advantage of the national rejuvenation that had been spurred by invasion and defeat. Casualties Italian losses were enormous, 10,000 were killed, 30,000 wounded and 265,000 were taken prisoner. Morale was so low among the Italian troops, mainly due to Cadorna's harsh disciplinary regime, that most of these surrendered willingly. 3,152 artillery pieces, 3,000 machine guns and 1,712 mortars were lost, along with a vast amount of stores and equipment. In contrast, the Austro-Hungarians and Germans sustained 70,000 casualties. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Subsequent operations. 
The last push of Austro-Hungarian and German forces was met and defeated by Italian forces at the First Battle of Monte Grappa. They had advanced more than 100 kilometers, 62 miles in the direction of Venice, but they were not able to cross the Piave River. Although up to this point the Italians had been left to fight on their own, after Caporetto they were reinforced by six French infantry divisions and five British infantry divisions as well as sizable air contingents. However, these troops played no role in stemming the advancing Germans and Austro-Hungarians, because they were deployed on the Mincio River, some 97 kilometers 60 miles behind the Piave, as the British and French strategists did not believe the Piave line could be held. The Piave served as a natural barrier where the Italians could establish a new defensive line, which was held during the subsequent Battle of the Piave River and later served as springboard for the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, where the Austro-Hungarian army was finally defeated after four days of resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy Opera Nazionale Combattenti, an Italian charitable organization, was set up in December 1917 in the immediate aftermath of the battle, to provide assistance to veterans of the First World War. It was closed in 1977. After the battle, the term, Caporetto, gained a particular resonance in Italy. It is used to denote a terrible defeat. The failed general strike of 1922 by the socialists was referred to by Mussolini as the Caporetto of Italian Socialism. Many years after the war, Caporetto was still being used to destroy the credibility of the liberal state. The Battle of Caporetto has been the subject of a number of books. British writer and military historian Cyril Falls' one volume The Battle of Caporetto is an operational and tactical account of the battle as the centerpiece of the larger campaign in northeastern Italy. Infantry Grafton Infantry Attacks, an interwar memoir and military handbook written by the future German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, features the actions of then Lieutenant Rommel and units he led during the battle, providing insight into stormtroop tactics. The Swedish author F. J. Nordsted PSEUD. Christian Braw wrote about the battle in his novel Caporetto. The bloody aftermath of Caporetto was vividly described by Ernest Hemingway in his novel A Farewell to Arms. Curzio Malapart wrote an excoriation of the battle in his first book, Viva Caporetto, published in 1921. It was censored by the state and suppressed, it was finally published in 1980. Today, a museum in the town of Kobarid is dedicated to the Isenzo battles in general, and the Caporetto battle in particular. <laughs> Notes <laughs>